Hi everyone, thank you for coming to Network Security. We're going to talk today uh, about entity authentication. Entity authentication. So what do we mean by entity? So it could be a person, it could be a computer, it could be a resource, it could be multiple things. So today we're going to distinguish between the message authentication. We already talk a lot about how to authenticate a message. Is it authentic, not authentic? And entity authentication. Then we define uh, the witness used for identification. Then we discuss some methods for entity authentication using passwords. So you could, a user is an entity. You could authenticate him with password. Enter your password. If it's a good password, then he is the correct entity or the authentic entity. To introduce some uh, challenge response protocols for entity authentication. Okay, there is different techniques called challenge response. Then we introduce some zero knowledge protocols for entity authentication. Then we define biometrics. Nowadays, you know, you could uh, log in with your eye, you know, with your fingerprints, uh, with your face log, you know, with, with it's a biometrics, right? So you could use biometrics uh, to distinguish between uh, physiological and behavioral techniques. So how we can authenticate an entity, okay? So entity authentication is a technique designed to let one party, one party, prove to <coughs> uh, prove the identity of another party. So you are logging into my, I'm a server, you're logging to me. So I have to know who you are, and you are the valid person that you are allowed to log in, all right? The entity can be a person, a process, a client, a server. Entity, anything needs to be authenticated, right? Before I told you, I mean, to my, our mind, we always would think that a client needs to be authenticated to a server. So, so for example, when you go to your bank, let's Chase Bank or People's United Bank. So you are a client, you are logging to the bank account. The bank server, web server, is the server. So you need to be authenticated to the server. That's not it. Also, the server needs to be authenticated to you. So what somebody send you a link or tell you this is the, 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 the web page or web server for Chase Bank, it's a fake one. So you put your username, your, your password, they take your username and password to go to the real one. So you cannot, anybody send you a link, this is the, for example, this is Chase Bank or this is bridgeboard2u.edu or this, and it could be a fake server. So you have to, the client has to be authenticated to the server and the server has to be authenticated to the client, otherwise it will become, uh, so you, that's you talk about the client server, the person, the process, all right? Sometimes the, 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 uh, you need to run a process in a server, the user does not log, uh, log in, but we have to verify, authenticate that process is allowed to work in that server, all right? So, um, uh, so, uh, uh, so for example, in, uh, in any machine, when you are logging as a client, not administrator, and you're trying to run a process, okay, the, the machine, the Windows, the Unix, operating system, whatever, you try to authenticate the process. Is it allowed to run in this machine as an administrator or not? So even the processes need to be authenticated, okay? So a client or a server, the entity whose identity needs to be proved is called the claimant, okay? Claimant, I claim, it's me claimant and the party that tries to prove the identity of the claimant is called verifier so we have a claimant we have verifier all right and again don't tell me the claimant is the client the verifier is the server it could be the other way so everybody has to be authentic to everybody or everything is has to be authentic for everything okay it's very important many people are not aware of that and a lot of the, uh, the, the password the cracking happened because of that. I mean, you, you log into the wrong server, long web server, okay, and you think that you only have to authenticate yourself to that server, but you also have to authenticate the server to you. You have to make sure it's a valid server, okay, valid server. So, data origin versus entity authentication. So uh, there are two differences between message authentication, data origin authentication. So in, in the message authentication, what we are trying to verify also, the origin. Remember the example of me telling you there is exam? 
next week. So it does not need to be private. It has to be authentic. You have to know it's coming from me. It's an authentic source, right? So that's why they call it data origin authentication, which we discussed a lot before. And there is so so the message message authentication might not happen in real time. So I could send you a message, and after one week you look at it, you need to authenticate it. It's not a real time application, all right? So entity, uh, but however, entity authentication is a real thing. So when you try to log in, that's a real time. So you have to authenticate me right away. I enter my password, username, password. I has to be authenticated right now. It's not like I enter password and then I have to wait two years until I get authenticated. So it's becoming like a real time application. When you go to the bank, okay, you sign in, you enter your best code. It's a real time application. So you have to be authenticated right away. All right. Message authentication simply authenticates one message. So every message needs to be authenticated. Okay, the process needs to be repeated for each new message. So for every message, you need to authenticate the message, make it it's, it's authentic. However, entity authentication, okay, authenticates the claimant for the entire duration of the session. So you establish a session, right? Like exactly, when you log into a server, you are establishing a session, right? So when you log into Amazon, for example, so you're starting a, se a session. So if you stay one minute or two minutes or three minutes or one hour, it's one session. You authenticate it once. Authenticate it once for the whole session. For the whole uh, session. All right. So there is um, uh, 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 categories for verification. It starts from something known or something uh, possessed. Something known about you or something you possess. Okay, so for example, if I need, uh, I mean, this, uh, something, something known. So for example, if um, you are known, for example, for your lock. Okay, that's something known. Something you possess. You have a unique eyeglasses. Okay, possess. That's a real life. Not okay. And something inherent. Something inherent. So maybe examples will explain. It. So entity authentication and key management. All right. So this, uh, in this, this chapter, we're gonna discuss entity authentication. The next chapter will discuss the key management, how to manage the keys, right? So, for example, when somebody logs to a server, okay, you, you know your password, but the server has to know your password, that this is a key, how it will be managed, how the server and you know your, 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 your okay, so that's a different story, we'll talk about it, okay. So, the simplest way for entity authentication is using passwords, right? It cannot be any simpler. So there is something called passwords that we could uh, talk about. So usually there is something called ID, which is a public. Your ID is a public, but your password is private. ID and password. So the simplest and oldest method of entity authentication is the password-based authentication where the password is something that the claimant knows. The claimant knows. I claim this is my entity, it's public. Okay, but this is a password that I know. So we could have fixed password or one-time password. We call it session password. Fixed password, okay, or time password. I think it makes sense so far. Nothing is no, right? So, for example, if you look in here, you user ID and password file. So, PA Alice's stored password so this is Alice computer it has a password uh, 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 and pass password sent by the claimant okay so now Alice which is a claimant okay so that's her ID Alice and then password it's gonna go to the Bob Bob the verifier so what will happen the Bob has a table password file user ID and password all right so it's, it, it's like lookup table. It will look where is the light has it, Alice. This is Alice. And it will check for the password, okay? And then the pass will go in here, and the stored password goes in here, and you compare that stored PA, okay, with that sent password. If they are same, then you grant access. If not, deny the access, all right? So in this case, what you, what's the problem? That you have to have a copy of the password stored. So if somebody breaks in Bob's, the verifier, verifier, you will know all the users and all that password. It's a simple technique, but you know, 
that's how it, you know, it's like a, a local, your, your computer, low computer, right? Okay, so when you have multiple users, like Windows, you could create multiple users, and every user will have a password. So when somebody tries to look to the computer, okay, you enter the user ID and the password. What will happen? You're going to go in a table inside your Windows and look up for it, right? If somebody breaks in the system, maybe you can get, you know, to the password, right? The second approach is using hashing the password. You hash the password. So what's the problem also here? There's another problem. The password is set as plain text. Why we don't use Telnet anymore? Anybody use Telnet? No. We use SSH. Why? Because Telnet, it sends the username and the password as a plain text. So if anybody has a snooping machine, has like sniffer, can get the, the, the user and the password. Just all you have to, to look at, right? Okay, so we use SSH. Why? Because it was in the password encrypted. Encrypted, right? So that's the prop. That's the problem in here. The problem in here that to send it as a plain text, that's not good. Anyone, you know, if you do turn it, I assure you now. If I, I uh, if I run a, a sniffer and you turn it to any machine, in one minute I will tell you your password. It's sent as a plain text. So, that is the same as a keylogger. What? Keylogger. Why is it the same? Because keylogger is also used in systems like if you type any username or password. So, through keylogger, we get to know what the username is. If it's not encry encrypted, then it's the same. I, no, I never use it. Okay, long time ago we used to turn it, we stopped turning it at all because anybody can get your password. Anybody running a sniffer right now can get your password. Never turn it. Never turn it anywhere because it, it sends the data as a plain text. You, we do SSH because it will be encrypted. Okay? Uh, so what we have to do in, in, in the second approach, we could have the hashing. So what we do, so Alice Clement will send um, uh, we'll send the, 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 the password. However, how we save it in here, we don't save the whole password, we save the hash of the password. So if somebody breaks in the table, cannot get the password. Okay? But again, if the person knows what kind of hash, can get the password, right? So what will happen in here, it was sent, so you, you, the password, you're gonna go to the same hash, it will reduce the hash of the pass, and from the table, we get the hash of the PA. If they are the same, then grant access. If not, don't grant an access. So it's like a little bit extra security. We don't save a plain password in your computer. You save it hashed. And that's how it is in Windows and all in Unix. It's not saved as a plain text, right? It's saved like uh, hashed, somehow hashed. The third approach is salting, adding a salt to it. Salt to it. So what you're doing here in the salt, so in the table you have Alice, you have the salt, okay, which is the, the, uh, a value, and then you, you don't hash only the password, what you hash, the password concatenated to the salt. The salt is a, ra a random number, right? So it's Alice's salt, it's like a value, right? So what will happen when you send it, it will, you're gonna have the password, it will be, concatenated okay uh, it will be you know uh, here um, and then will be hashed so we hash function for the uh, uh, for the uh, password with the salt if they are the same then you grant if they are different turn to grant all right so the first one no hashing the second one with hashing the third one hashing with a salt with it which is the random number okay the fourth approach to uh, identification techniques are combined. A good example of this type uh, of authentication is the use of, of ATM card with a pen. ATM card with a pen. So ATM, when you slide it, there is, it, you know, the reader will hash, will dehash, will, will hash again and compare, right? That's what will happen. So the cards, we have the card, the ATM card, there's a chip inside it. The data. So when you slide it, there's a reader, and the reader reads the data and hash, uh, dehash it, I and mean, create the, the, the digest and compare them. On top of that, also what we do, we enter the PIN number. So we have two combination of things. So, you know, by, by having a PIN and, and uh, 
ATM, ATM reward. Okay, that will increase the security level. All right. So um, the one type of um, you know. Um, There is something called one-time password. So these passwords are there. You could repeat them many times, right? Like your machine, your Windows, your Mac, and you log in the same password all the time. You could create something called one-time password in multiple approaches. So in the first approach, the user and the system agree upon a list of passwords. All right? So, you know, hundred passwords. So the first time we log, we use the, the, the password number one. And no, second time, number two. It's not practical, right? How can you, I mean, to agree, you have to find a mechanism to have an agreement in the, ba in the passwords and the number of passwords. And no matter how many you have, they will finish, right? Especially if you have. So that's the first approach. The second approach, in the second approach, the user and the system agree to sequentially update the password. So you start with the password, then sequentially keep updating. Again, it's not very secure, not all of that. Third approach, in the third approach, the user and the system create a sequentially updated password using a hash function. Using a hash function, all right? So, um, so for example, you know, the hash number n, so you start in here, the first, the first, so the first one, the first password is the hash of x, okay, will be the first password. The second one, it will be the hash of the hash. The third one, the hash of the hash of the hash. Number n is the hash of the previous hash, of the previous hash to the first hash. So you keep ha every time you're trying to use a different password, you hash it again, that will be the new password. All right? So a little bit make this complex, but it's not also um, very, uh, very secure. So there is something called Lambert one time a password. So what we have in here uh, what we have uh, we have the Alice uh, as the claimant and Bob the verifier. So what will happen? Alice since the username. Okay. So you're gonna have uh, uh, originally uh, you know uh, the table Alice. I stored n and hash of n for a password, for a password, right? Okay, the Bob will send n back, okay? And uh, Alice will send the hash n minus one for P0 in the previous one. Because remember the first hash, the second hash of the hash of the hash of the hash. So it will send the previous hash of the P0, you hash it again, okay, if you, because this will be stored anyway, the P0, it will be stored anyways with Alice, right? So Alice will send, because now what is, what is, what is in store is hash number N, right? The number N hash, or the Nth hash is stored, all right? So when you send the N, it, it will look up in the tail and will send the Nth minus one hash. You send it, you hash it again, we're going to get what? The nth hash. All right? You compare it with the stored one, the nth hash with the nth hash. So when you hash the n minus 1, it will become the nth hash. Right? So you compare the nth hash with the nth hash. If they are equal, then a grant that is. If they are not equal, don't do grant that. Okay? All right? So this Lambert, called Lambert, it's the same idea, okay? And then after that, after that, what will happen? You update. You do the update, Alice, it will be n minus 1, okay? And then h n minus 1 p. So in here, we kind of starting from the last hash. And then we go to the previous hash, previous hash. What happens when n equals 1? If it's n equal to 1, we start with no hash, P0, because no hashed. Right? So the first hash will be 1. 
the second hash, two, two. third mm -hmm. hash, four, third, fourth, up to n. Okay? So if it's, you are at, uh, uh, first of all, you should not use one, but if you use one, then you have the p0 without hashing. Okay? So it's still limited, right? Yeah, it's limited, yeah, of course. Limited to the maximum of n. Because you start from the end. Okay? So you start from the end. So you agree on the hash. So you start, for example, let's say n equals 100. So the first time, Alice, 100, h to power 100 of the p0. Next time, 99. Next time, 98, and so on and so forth. Limited, of course. So, Professor, uh, is p not while well, original entry? So, if n is 1, so could p not be without hashtag? Well, the idea here always you have to have hash because for more secure, yeah. Because if n is going to be one, so h n which is going to be one, so one into p not doesn't, I mean, make sense. No, one is it's not a power. We're not using a power. This is the number of hash. Mm -hmm. It's not we are expo uh, doing exponential mm -hmm. exponent uh, of one or two or n. Oh. We are the, the number. So when you say h to n, that means the hash number, n. So which means hashtag should be there with p not. It is mandatory for the P0 to be with... B, always B0, it B, has yeah. to be... Okay, we don't save P0 anywhere, so... Let me explain it a little bit, so... So, okay, so you have in here, let's say, the client, and in here, the server, right? The client has the, the password, all right? I don't want to save the password in the, this computer. I don't want to store the password on this computer. So what do I store? The hash of it. Okay? If I store one hash, I keep using one hash, this is not security. So what we'll do, we'll store hash of the hash. Okay, so for the first time, I will, uh, for the first time I have the hash of P0. Okay, let's call it whatever. We'll call it what? This is like hash one. I'm sorry, hash one like that. Okay, then hash two equals to what? Hash of P0. Okay, hash again. Okay, then P H3 equals P0. Hashed once, hashed twice, hashed third time. Understand? So the first time, the first time I communicate, for example, I start with this as a password. Next time I don't use it again. Why we call it a session, one time password. So I can use the password once. Okay? So the next time what I, do, I use as a password, hash of the hash. And so on and so forth. Okay? It's one time password. Uh, okay. Yes. This this model on um, security is still vulnerable to um, hacking, right? It's what? It's vulnerable to being hacked. Because if someone knows the, the pattern at which it's going, it, it just keeps sure. going and going. Okay, sure. The side you have to hide the mechanism of hashing that you are doing in here and the number. Where are you starting from? Okay. So, uh, oh, so, so what will happen? What what will have in the, the what what you're gonna save in here? What you're gonna save in here is what? On the hash. So you're gonna save the max hash. So you, you don't start from one. You start from where? The last part. From the last one, the max one. So you start with the hash number hundred, for example. <coughs> Okay, and then that will, will send you what? The hash number 99, you hashed again, that's what we compare it. All right? And by the way, these are techniques not used nowadays. We are going through it. Okay, you know? Okay, we, we, all right. So I'm not trying, I'm trying to convince you it's a very secure, but you have to know how things started, right? To understand how we are progressing, right? All right, then after that we come for challenge response. Challenge response, okay? So in the password authentication, the claimant proves 
her identity by the, uh, demonstrating that she knows a secret. What is a secret? The password, right? The password. The challenge response authentication, the claimant proves that she knows a secret without sending it. Okay? So I'll prove to you that I know a secret, but I'm not going to send it to you. You know I have the secret, but without I send it. So then, in here we avoided the whole sending the, the password, okay? Sending the, we, don't, we, we don't like that. We don't like to send password over, or password over the network. Okay, whether a plane or encrypted and all, because, you know, like you said, yeah, exactly, it could be half and all of that, right? So we're gonna talk about using a symmetric key cipher, using key hash function, using asymmetric key cipher, using digital signature. Okay. All right. So, so in challenge response authentication, the claimant proves that she knows a secret without sending it to the verifier. We don't have to send it. The challenge is a time varying value. Time varying value. That means it varies over time sent by the verifier. The response is the result of a function applied on the challenge. So who sent the, the verifier? Sent the question. And uh, the claimant has to respond. So let's take a look in here. Okay, so in here, all right, uh, nonce challenge. So for example, you have Alice, the claimant, and Bob, the verifier, our players, okay? So, so Alice sent the, 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 the login name, whatever. Then Bob sent RB, what's RB? What's RB? It's a nonce, it's just, uh, you know, nonce is a value that's randomly used its first time, all right? So you send RP from Bob, nonce, a value, any value, any, any value. Then Alice, what does it do? Will encrypt the nonce using what? The shared key between A and B, all right? All right, so did we send any password in here? No. We did not send any password. Okay, so Alice would like to communicate with Bob. Bob told, okay, you wanna communicate with me? Okay, verify it to me, we send it a nonce, any number, any value, right? Then it will be encrypted by the shared key. So they don't send any password in the communication. So Bob will receive the RP, this message, will decrypt it, will get the RP. Compare the RPs, the ones sent and one received. If they are equal then, yes, it is what? Alice. All right. A second approach is using a timestamp. Okay. So in, in instead of sending an Alice, you're sending the timestamp. So it will send Alice with a timestamp encrypted with the shared key. So in here, you know, you know, uh, uh, the the Alice did not send the secret, but this way Bob knows that Alice has a secret. So the whole idea, Bob knows that Alice has or has the secret without sending it. Good? All right? Don't you think it's a little bit more secure? Yeah. yeah. All right. All right, third approach in here is uh, bi-directional authentication. And that's what we need. That's what we need. We need both to authenticate to each other server to client, the client to server. So Alice, then Al Alice sends to Bob, then Bob says, okay, you wanna, you wanna, I need to verify you. Okay, sign this for me, send a nonce. Then it will send a nonce, okay, with RA, which is another nonce coming from where? From Alice to where? To Bob. So Bob will decrypt it, will get RP, compare it, yeah, it's the same. Okay, let me sign RA. 
they'll send back R, uh, RPA to him, to them, okay? And now but Alice will verify that is a bot. Because there's a shared key between them. So both authenticated each other. How nice. Right? Yeah. Authenticated each other, right? All right. So that's part of directional. And, uh, and, and look in here. Uh, you, you know, they reverse the order to prevent the replay. If they send it back, it will be the same as to prevent the replay, right? Okay. You could, you know, using keyed hash function. So, and instead of using encryption decryption for entity authentication, we also could use keyed hash function, MAC. You know what's hash function, right? From the hash function, like what's example for a hash fun function? Well, give me an example for a hash function. RSA. Hmm? RSA. RSA. RSA is a hash function? Mm. How about SHA1? SHA5. SHA okay, how about uh, M5? M uh -huh. M5. Yes. Okay, these are hash functions. When you created the, and we learned how to create them, right? Did you guys do the homework? All right. So we did not need a, we did not need the, to have a, a, a shared key to create the hash, the digest, right? So what is hash function? It's you takes any the input any size of data, and then will give you a similar size digest. We never needed a key to do that. We could have hash functions with a key. So we create a hash function with a shared key. That we call it MAC. Okay, we call it MAC, like MAC. So what will happen in here? Okay, Alice will send will send her name, timestamp, and then hashes the Alice Pop secret key. So Alice and Pop know the key in here. All right. So it will hash the key. It will hash the key. So it, it get, it's not going to send, send the key, or the, the key is the password. It's not going to send the key or the password. What you are sending in here, the hash of it. The hash of it. So the hash of it plus T. So the time, so, so why you have to do it like this? Because when Bob receives it, okay, he receives it, Bob will receive also the T. T is out and inside, we will receive the T. And Bob knows the shared key. So Bob will calculate H of the key plus the T again. If they are equal, then it's good. If they are not equal, then it's bad. Got it? So one more time. Why we have T in here and T in here? Okay, so, so the key is shared between Alice and Bob. It will send Alice, that's the name. T is a timestamp, these are equal. So when Bob received it, Bob has to generate this again. Could he? Yes, why? Because he has the T, where is the T? Coming as a plain text in here. And he has the key, where is the key? Shared between them. So generate the hash prime for this value, if they are equal, then, then it's perfect. All right, you got it? So, I cannot see from the clock. So, in here, then using a asymmetric key cipher. What's asymmetric? Two keys, public and private, right? So, the first approach, uh, this is the uh, unidirectional asymmetric key authentication. So, what will happen? Okay, first of all, the key A is encrypted with Alice's public key. Uh, so, Alice, go to Bob. Bob needs to verify. So, Bob what sends RP, which is announced, with and the name. And this will be encrypted with the key A. What's key A? Is in, uh, key A, it's the, 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 the public key of Alice. Alice. Public key of Alice. Alice will receive it. Can, can, it re can it read it? Yes, why? Because it has its own private key. It will unlock it with its own private key, right? Then it sends the RP. So RP, uh, Bob sends the RP originally and receive the RP. If they are equal, then it's authentic. Shall I repeat it one more time? Okay. So 
Alice would like to communicate with Bob. Bob says, let me verify you. Then Bob, using the public key of Alice, encrypts his name with announce. Receive. Alice will be able to read this because she has her own private key. Now, it takes the RP, sends it back. If the received RB equals to the one cent, then it's authenticated. Good. Another approach, bidirectional asymmetric key. There is the same thing. So now we need to authenticate each other. We need to authenticate each other. So in here what will happen, Alice would like to communicate with Bob. So it will send to Bob the name, I would like to communicate with you, and announce. Encrypted with... Bob's public public uh, uh, public key. Then Bob sends back the R B of him R A which she has received and the name with the public key of Alice. Alice. And then at the end uh, Alice sends the R B. So they are authenticating to each other. Okay. So now send the, uh, you know they are authenticated to each other. All right. Then we could have digital signature. Last class we were talking about digital signature, right? So remember we compared about real signature and digital signature. For digital signature, every document has different signature. That's number one. Number two, we could send the document separate from the signature, right? We studied that last time. So in here, the digital signature, unidirectional. So what will happen? Alice, I would like to communicate with you, Mr. Paul. Bob says, okay, I need to verify you, I'll, it will send a nonce. Then Bob sends a message, his name, and a message signed that includes RP, which he received, and the Bob, the name. Signed with Alice's private key. It will be signed with Alice's private key. Then Bob will be able to use the public key of Alice to verify it. Digital signature. So we use digital signature in this application. Right. In real life, if you're writing, writing application, web application, or any application, and requires all of this, so that's part of your code. Okay, so there is a library for signing a, for using a signature, one of the algorithm signatures. So you just include that, and you're gonna just write the logic. Okay, second approach in here: digital signature, bidirectional authentication. Right. All right. So what will happen? Alice sends, oh, uh, uh, Bob, I would like to communicate with you. Then Bob says, Alice, I need to verify you. Take my nonce. It goes to Alice. So Alice will go, will send that a new nonce of her with a name to Bob and signature for the RP which received with Bob. And this will be signed with Alice's private key. Then Bob will be able to read it with her public key. Then the other way of, uh, okay, it will send Alice, sign RA, Alice, and this signed by Bob, private key. Okay? So, two entries. So, how many techniques you have learned so far? Many. All right? Many, all right? All right. There is something called zero, zero knowledge. In zero knowledge authentication, the claimant does not reveal anything that might endanger the confidentiality of the secret. Reveal none, reveal nothing. Okay? Uh, so the claimant proves to the verifier that she knows a secret without revealing it. The interaction are so designed that they cannot lead to revealing or guessing the secret. Okay? So we'll talk about, I think, three. Fetch, Shammer, Protocol, uh, Fiat, Shammer, Protocol, and Giolio, uh, Quasquar, or uh, Quasquater Protocol, three of them. All right. So the first one in here, the Fetch, Shammer, Protocol. So this S is Alice's private key, R is Alice's public key, and uh, uh, V, V. And R is random number. So what will happen in here? Alice will do x to the power 
Uh, so X is what? A number. Okay? Generated by the Alice's public key to the power 2 mod n. Okay? So X would be the witness. You send the witness. So you generate the witness, you send the witness. Then Bob will send a challenge, which is C. Okay? Then cal uh, calculate Y, which is R. Okay? Uh, the, the, the random number. S to the power, S which is the private key to the power C, the challenge, mod N. And that would be Y. You said Y. Okay. Again there. So, now what you'll compare, I mean, Bob, Bob will have, will receive the Y, will calculate Y squared mod N. If it equals to X, because Y equals what? Um, uh, uh, R, uh, S uh, to power C. So, X uh, v to bar c, but if they are equally calculate them, then yes, possibly or no. Okay, so this is one of the uh, techniques. So in here, we just prove that we prove that you know uh, x v to power c mod n is equals to y squared. So this value is equal to y squared. Right. This is the give 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 example. Uh, just take a look at it. It's just to prove it the, the whole process in here. And then after that, we have the uh, uh, page faith the Shaman protocol. All right. Uh, so in here, same idea. Okay. Uh, to the previous one, except it uses vector of a private keys, not one private key, a vector of private keys. Okay, so you'll have, for example, S1, S2, S whatever, and this is our private key. These are the private uh, uh, keys, and then it has the V's. The V's are the Alice's public key, and then the random number. So in here, we don't, we, we are not, we're dealing kind of a mattress rather than dealing with one value. All right. So again, the same thing. X will be calculated, which is a challenge or witness. It will be sent. Okay. Then the challenge will be multiple C's, not one C. And Y will be multiple Y. So you say Y, and then you do the, you know, the the, the challenge, the calculation. If they are equal, then yes or no. So this is just to make it more secure. You sharing a vector rather than one value. All right. Uh, third way is um, uh, what they call it Galilo um, uh, uh, quas quater. I don't know if that pronunciation is correct or not, you know. Uh, but again, it's uh, same idea is a challenge and response. Okay. So what you'll have, you'll have the S, which is the Alice is a private key, and then you have the R, which is the public key and the running number. You're going to create X, you send it, then the challenge, you send um, uh, C, uh, C or 1 to C, okay, uh, which is C, which is 1 to E, C, 1 to E, and then you calculate Y, send Y, then you do the calculation, the X equals Y to bar E, because it's, it's, uh, it might be secure. Okay, the same thing. This is the same graph in here. It's repeated the graph, I don't know why. Alright. Then the last thing is using biometrics. Biometrics is all of us have biometrics, right? So biometrics is the measurement of uh, physiological or behavioral features 
that identify a person authentication by some thinning inherence. So your eyes, cornea is inherent, right? Fingerprints is inherent. You have unique one, right? Okay. Uh, biometrics measures feature that cannot be guessed, stolen, or shared, supposedly, right? So several components are needed for biometrics, including capturing devices. If you, for example, would like to use like uh, the eye signature, what do you, ha you have to capture? Capture and then compare to the database, all right? And you have to have a process. Capture, process, compare, okay? And then storage uh, devices. So you have to start with the enrollment to the database, right? So before using any biometric technique for authentication, the corresponding feature of each person in the community should be available in the database. Right? So for example, now for face recognition applications, okay, you could have a database with all criminals. Okay, database, a like central database in the United States. And, you know, all the cameras in the public, when they capture a face, they compare it to the database there. But you have to have a database first to compare it with, right? Fingerprint, if you need to look into your uh, ATM machine, for example, or by eye signature. So it has to have a database. So let's say the bank has 5 million customers. You have to have a 5 million entry for 5 million customers for their eye signature or finger signature. So you have to enroll people there and then you do the comparison, right? So this is referred to enrollment, right, to enrollment. Then you have to have a, a verification, after verification, identification. There are so many biometrics, uh, something uh, behavioral, and some of them are uh, psychological, like fingerprint, iris, retina, face, hands, voice, DNA. All of these are uh, physiological. It's a physiological, so, okay? And there is something behavioral, like for like, keystroke. So a person when he's stroking the keyboard or in the bad, the way he's stroking, the strength, the frequency, the speed, he could identify the person, right? So it's very complex, right? Uh, for example, the signature, right? So now uh, uh, you could have your signature and the signature could compare with the database automatically, okay? Uh, so physiological techniques, uh, fingerprint, iris, retina, face, hands, voice, DNA, again, signature keystroke. Always there is a problem with the accuracy with these, accuracy, because always there is something called uh, false rejection rate and false acceptance rate. False rejection rate that you reject the person while it's correct. So I go, I put my fingerprint, you are rejected, but it's me. Okay, there's always a possibility, there's a rate. And there is false acceptance rate, which means more, you accept somebody who is not. So I'm trying to log in, pretending somebody else, and log me in, and it's not me, it's not my account. Okay, so these are one of the problems. There are so many applications, several applications of bioinformatics are already in use in commercial environments. These include access to facilities. You know, all of us now we have thumb log into iPads, right? Right? Thumb log in. Okay? So, I mean, luckily it's, it's uh, accurate because it's one signature saved in one machine. So the machine only accepts one. But what if this machine accepts like, like uh, ATM thousands of people? Like, okay? There's a possibility for uh, false, right? Either rejection or acceptance. So, um, uh, several applications of biometrics are already in use in the commercial environments. These include access to facilities, access to information system. You see in, in, in our building, you scan your ID, right? But this is not biometrics, by the way. Okay. Uh, at point uh, of sale and employee timekeeping in the law enforcement, uh, law enforcement system, they include investigations using fingerprints and DNA and forensic analysis. Border control uh, and immigration control also use some bioinformatic techniques. So 
still developed a lot of research, even in here, students doing a lot of research in the PhD level, you know, face recognition and, you know, um, bio, in the bioinformatics area and all of that. So that's a development area. Uh, always you have to combine this kind of authentication with other authentication. So what if you fail? Even if you look at your I iPad, if you use like a thumb login, if you fail, it will give you the option to enter the password and or the pin. Thank you.